And what I found when I was doing the research is that there really wasn't any research at the time in 2007 on the importance of yoga for young children. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Child Care Channel and the Child Care Channel podcast. Our goal is to inform, inspire, and innovate in the child care space with the intention to have a positive influence in the broken childcare industry in the United States. My name is Yane Diaz and I am your host. Our guest today is Dr. Nicole Richburn. Dr. Nicole Richburn is an expert in the field of early childhood special education. She is currently working as an assistant principal of early childhood and is a part-time adjunct professor for Grand Canyon University. In 2017, she self-published a book all for the kids, yoga for children, after spending a year traveling throughout the country and providing workshops on the benefits of yoga and movement for children. Nicole, it's such a pleasure to have you on the channel. Thank you so much, Shane. I'm happy to be here. Well, so this is a topic that we haven't quite talked about yet on the channel. So there's a bunch of questions that I want to get into, but tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into this you know, working with children and yoga. Just just give us the story. All right, great. So 22 years ago is when I entered the field of education. And when I entered, I thought I just wanted to be a classroom teacher, you know, in second grade, first grade. I ended up in special education because of school buildings closing, budgets were cut, and it turned out to be my passion, preschool. When I taught preschool, I discovered my passion for, you know, special education preschool where learning really happens, you know, massive learning at the age of three. So I was so inspired by that, that it just, it was a constant deep dive into, you know, what's going on with these kids. How can we support them? And then the way that I came across yoga for kids, I was actually training to be a yoga instructor. It was one of my goals as one of my martial arts ranks. I needed to set personal goals. And that was a personal goal of mine. And so when I began studying yoga for my certification, I discovered the importance of and what yoga does for the brain and development and how it supports our central nervous system. And so a light bulb went off and I was like, wait a minute, this could potentially help the kids. So I also needed some subjects to practice my yoga lingo on. So I would do it every morning at circle time with my kids. And then I noticed that when they would go to the tables to do their table time work, they were so focused, they were quiet, it minimized behaviors, and they really seemed to be in tune in the classroom. And so as I was getting my doctorate, I proposed that as my research for my dissertation, and it was approved. And what I found when I was doing the research is that there really wasn't any research at the time in 2007 on the importance of yoga for young children. And so that's what led me down that path. And of course, working in preschool and special education and early childhood, it's just it's mind blowing. And it's pretty amazing to see how much these kids can do when you support them. So it just has become such a passion working in early childhood. Oh, that's amazing. I love it. I think yoga has picked up, especially in the global West in the last several years. But you're right. I haven't really seen as much specialty in children, especially really young children, as perhaps everywhere else with the adults, right? So let's let's talk a little bit more about this. You've probably had many years by now testing this out, and I know that you also travel to multiple places. So let's get a little bit more specific about what were some of the things that you observed. So for example, you just mentioned there was a yoga vocabulary that you were using with the kids. Yes. Can you give us some example of how that went? Sure. I did not do the technical, the Sanskrit terms for the words. And what I found when I was doing it in my classroom is that the kids loved modeling and demonstrating, you know, the moves. They loved simple. They could follow directions. And it was such a great time to practice one step and two step directions with them as well. So I was integrating a lot of what their, you know, the domains of learning require at that age. The kids picked up on it surprisingly right away. When I did my actual study, I did it in two other school districts. I didn't do it in the one I worked in. I wanted to eliminate bias there. So I compared two different school districts, two totally different socioeconomic status as well. 
And it was amazing that the kids were still able to, you know, they, there were no problems. It was enjoyable. It was fun for them. And they definitely improved in their attention. And that was one thing I wanted to look at with them was how does it improve their attention? And, and of course, when they're doing something engaging, they're learning to sustain their attention anyway. So it just transfers over into other skills in the classroom as well. I love that because especially we are, and this is my very personal feeling, I feel we're in the age of ADD, ADHD, and easy diagnosis of ADD, ADHD, Mm -hmm. when in many cases the child is just bored or they're just not engaged enough or, you know, they need a different kind of education, right? So when thinking about that and when thinking about different types of children, different types of learning styles, and this includes children with special needs, right? What have you noticed as far as the adoption on the little ones for these types of practices? It's actually something that I think they don't realize they're missing. Obviously, kids don't. But I think parents don't realize how much it is needed. I think that there's a misconception that, well, my child will never sit for that long or they'll never be able to attend because their attention is terrible. And that's exactly why they need to. Because if you think about it, I actually went in 2008 to a conference, the Learning in the Brain Society, and it was all around, they talked about data in the digital world. And our, you know, we have a lot of kids that are looking at tablets, that are looking at screens on iPhones, playing games, and and they're, they're instructional and they're games that they definitely get a lot of input from. But the challenge is, is that all of the pixels on the screen are moving so rapidly and kids are so used to instant gratification by playing those games that their brains aren't slowing down and not learning how to relax. And so we can counter that with implementing yoga and mindfulness for kids and an intentional practice where we are setting them up in their day and throughout the day so that they have those opportunities to slow their minds down and to recenter themselves and calm, calm down. That is so necessary because we see it, of course, we see it in the adults. And I, I personally, I, one of the things that I, that I do in my life's mission is really connecting people with their inner peace. And I have this concept called pasitud, which means attitude of peace. And one of the biggest symptoms of the people that I work with and everything is they can't shut the mind down mm-hmm. in their own words, right? And so this shows up in in inability to relax, in, you know, recurring forms of stress that we know lead to hundreds and hundreds of disease in the body. So teaching children how to manage this in such a formative early age, I think it's going to make a huge, huge difference when they become the adult, right? So how can a center who takes care of small children, what are some easy things that they can do or incorporate to start easing them into this? That's a great question. And I get asked that a lot because there's also a misconception that you need to know yoga or be good at yoga in order to teach it. But when you work with kids, if you think about some of the simple strategies we use when we try to just calm them down when they're having a tantrum or when they're upset about something, The same things can apply when you're trying to get them exposed to yoga. So for example, breathing techniques, linking breath with movement is yoga. And yoga is really just doing that. It's mindfulness and being in the moment and slowing ourselves down. So if we can get kids to start or centers can really just start with, you know, sit crisscross, sit your body up nice and tall, and then practice breathing and focus on something, you know, have the kids Find something that they like, a picture they like, or something in the room and see if they can focus on that and then time them. They can even make it a game so that they can actually start that intentional attention practice, linking it with the breath. And then movement. Movement can be so simple. They can pick five postures and kids love doing these because there's cat, there's dog, there's wagging the cat's tail, simple things like that, that Anybody can really instruct kids on doing that. Okay, I love that. I love the simplicity, the fun. Of course, the best way to learn we know is through play. And that applies for kids and for adults too. So one of the potential challenges I see, and maybe you can chime in further on this, is adoption, right? Because I know that a lot of childcare centers are understaffed or 
their time is really fully committed in a lot of day to day. So learning something new or implementing something new into their day to day might be challenging. So mm -hmm. do you have any sort of suggestions or tips or to make this process easier? Sure. I think that there are a couple of ways and certainly the childcare industry is so depleted right now and burnt out, which is understandable, especially after the past few years and what they're coping with, with, you know, some of the behaviors we're seeing. And so simple ways to do it. I always say the beginning of a day, because the way that you start your day determines how you're going to move through your day. So for kids, it's no different. When I taught preschool, when the kids would enter in the morning, I always set it up. I had a Mozart for children, which was a CD back in, in those days. I had that playing softly in the background. And the kids always would have to get her a book or a puzzle and sit quietly while we waited for everybody to arrive. So I think for teachers in child care centers, if they're thinking of what they truly want in their day, how they want to set it up, they can implement these kinds of things throughout that day. So starting with intentional focused, you know, making sure that that environment is set up so that it's calming. And so we're reducing distraction and we're clear on what we want the kids to do. And then start with a yoga practice and start with speaking softly, keep the lights down, keep the music going. I'm a big advocate for soft music playing in the background that just soothes the mind and emotions in kids. Because if we think of that too, young children, there's a lot of overwhelming feelings they have in a day. So we can, if we can help temper that with some calming things like speaking softly, soft music in the background, it can help keep them, you know, a little bit more calm. There's also, I know that there are apps that do have yoga on them. I have a book that I created, which makes it really easy. So there's photos on one side. So the teacher can just flip the book over and the instructions that they would actually read to the kids to get into a pose are on the back side. Let me ask you. So I know we mentioned this earlier, but can you remind us where we can find the book? What's the title of the book? Yes. So it's all for the kids, Yoga for Children. It's on Amazon and it's published by First Edition Design Publishing. So that's the one that that they should look for. And like I said, I and it was a, a paraprofessional was the illustrator. She created some great images for the book of kids doing yoga. So um, I wanted to make that simple as well so that anybody that says, well, I don't know yoga and I don't know how to, you know, instruct it, this takes all of that out of it. So there's the picture to have kids model. And on the back, it's step one, tell the kids, you know, to stand with their feet under their hips. And then it walks them through step by step so that eventually you can just hold up the card or hold up the page and say, okay, do this pose and the kids can do it. Oh, I love that. It sounds like a very simple way to incorporate for teachers to incorporate this with the small children. Yes. Very, very nice. And this book you said was a result of your dissertation that you yes. worked on. What was your dissertation on? It was on yoga to increase attention of preschool children. And this was for your PhD in, in what area? Yes. My PhD is in education with a concentration in curriculum and instruction. Amazing. Amazing. And then you have a book out of this and you said you traveled for one year, right? So I did. I what, did. What was that for? So for PESI education and summit education, they would send me to three cities in three days and I would provide professional development for teachers, for therapists, for anyone else that was interested in yoga for kids. And so it would be an eight hour day. I would take them through the background, the brain research the why it works, and then give them an opportunity in the afternoon to practice teaching each other yoga. Wow, that was cool. And did you have any sort of a result statistics reported back to you after they implemented something like this? You know, that's one thing that I did not do was ask them to let me know how it was going. And I did leave it open if they wanted to reach out with any questions. I did a professional development here last year for the teachers, but I did find that Sometimes they're not being intentional and in putting it in the day. And I think that that is probably one of the biggest things is that it's really important for anyone that wants to implement that in a, in a school setting or a daycare setting that you're really intentional about planning that in. And it really only needs to be five minutes long. It really does not need to be, you know, a, a big duration of time to have a big impact. 
Yeah, no, I get it. And, you know, like anything, consistency is always not as easy to accomplish. Discipline and consistency. And so, of course, you yeah. have to actually do it to, to get the results exactly. and measure <laughs> over time. So hopefully right. we'll have you back on the channel later on with some case studies and statistics that because I do firmly believe this is not a should have. I, I, this is this is not a will be nice to have. This is a must have in this modern, busy hyper-connected world. So absolutely. I want to shift a little bit now to, I know you're in Massachusetts and I know you're working with the preschool and the public system as well. And with a concentration in, in children with special needs, can you share with us in more detail the type of access and support that you've seen has results for children with special needs? Sure. So every state it, you know, falls under the same federal laws as far as special needs. But here in Massachusetts, I'm most familiar with our laws here, our local, and how we best support kids. So what my role is, is I help transition kids from early intervention services into the public school system for their evaluation so that we can determine if there's, you know, eligibility for services. And I will say that I think Massachusetts does a great job with supporting young children with special needs. What's happened, though, of course, not only with the high population, the past few years with the pandemic, it's created quite a challenge with kids not having exposure to experiences or, you know, anything resulting where, you know, they're finally coming into preschool or any other circumstances that went on, you know, during that time that prevented them from getting, you know, access to education. And so what Massachusetts has done, it's called the Commonwealth Preschool Partnership Initiative, otherwise known as Universal Preschool. And so there's grants for competitive grants for cities and towns here in Massachusetts to take advantage or apply for that so that we can really build a whole system of early childhood support. So we're supporting child care centers and, and anywhere really that works with young children, not just with special needs. However, we are looking at that is a component where some districts look at how can we provide, you know, teams and staff from the public school system to supporting the daycare centers and community providers for kids that just need some extra support. Okay. So I know that there are some child care centers that need to have a special classification to be able to educate children with special needs. Is this something that you help centers with if they want to make that transition? We would not help with the licensing requirements. So for us, in order to access the grant and support a community program, they would have to be a licensed program. So we don't do that. There are so many centers and home-based providers here in Massachusetts as well. So it really is on, you know, on them to do that work, to do the background steps that it takes in order for us to be able to support them. Okay. Okay. That's fair. And when, so when it comes to your, your expertise and implementing things like this, I love the universal preschool grant and the fact that you know, there's a lot of families who can't afford preschool. That's one of the big, big stressors of the childcare industry as a whole, right? Right. And so can you tell us a little bit more about this program? And I know we're specifically talking about Massachusetts, but would you have any sort of tips or suggestions for other centers to look into this, even if they're not in Massachusetts? Sure. I think that any time that you're building a partnership and accessing the community is beneficial. In one of the courses I teach, one of the graduate courses, we talk about reaching out to community resources, getting to know who they are, and then creating a partnership with them. I think that, you know, anybody who works with young children, you know, the reach is, is far. They not only go, some families go to a YMCA or United Way, but they also attend, you know, a preschool program, or they may go to gymnastics or soccer. And so there are so many activities and opportunities for communities to really come together. And I think what that takes is somebody to take the lead. Here in Massachusetts, we also have, it's called the CFCE. So it's Coordinated Family and Community Engagement, which means there's one person to oversee the community activities and bring them together for the families as well and provide family support. But we don't have that across the country. 
So there's other programs, like I think it's parent to parent resources. There's a lot of those types of organizations that are, I feel like school districts just aren't aware enough of them and how to best utilize them. Because I think it is an opportunity for whether it be the private providers to be the ones to initiate that contact and that support or the public school systems to be the ones to really, you know, take the lead on that and be the ones to bridge that gap that's between community and school. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, that, this is a great starting point, right? And what are you wanting to, to see as, as, as a change in the industry? Gosh, that's a big question because, you know, with early childhood being my passion, I think we really need everybody to get on board to realize the importance of supporting these young children. These children are our future. And however we set them up today builds the foundation for everything that's to come. And so these are going to be our doctors, our lawyers, our school teachers, and our community providers you know, down the road. And so I think if we can really provide that sound, cohesive support for them, and my vision is that, you know, I'm excited if, if we get this grant, if we're awarded this grant, that we can have a bigger reach and really create a strong support system for these kids and families in our community so that they can go on and we can know that we've really provided a strong, solid foundation for them to build on. And what I would love to see in, in you know, our country and beyond is that people realizing it doesn't need to be. I think there's such a culture sometimes of, well, that's not my job, that I don't do that. That's not my job. My response is always, if you're passionate about it and you want to see a change and do something about it, then you jump in and do it. Make it your job. It doesn't need to be whoever has that title or whoever has that position. I think that if we really want to implement change and see things move for these kids and provide support, then if you've got the passion and heart, then I really would love to see more people jumping on board and doing that. Amazing. And and I do believe that childcare is one of those industries that I would say most people go into for the heart of it, you know, because they really yeah. want to the best for children. They really want to shape the next generations in the best way possible. A lot of these kids don't get a whole lot of love or even even the families who are more in a economic disadvantage, you know, they don't even get certain foods, right? Or, or meals or amount of meals per day. And so it really is a very, very, very integral part of the entire ecosystem of the entire United States. We often say that childcare is the backbone of the U.S. economy. It's, every, it's the foundation of everything. Mm -hmm. And I venture to say it's the foundation of future success. Right. Like you just said, Definitely. we're shaping the future leaders, the future doctors. And so, you know, I think this work is really important. Where can people find you, Nicole, if they want to work with you or learn more? Sure. So I'm on Instagram. It's at and rich educator. Very good. So if you listening, if you've liked this so far, please subscribe to the channel. Give it a thumbs up. Share it because. If anything here could be useful for a colleague, for yourself, or anybody that you know who takes care of young children and who educates young children, please do share it because we do want this information to be helpful in shaping how we pretty much impact the evolution of the childcare industry for the better here in the United States. And Nicole, are there any, any things that you want to share before we move on to a little game that we play here at the channel called Three in a Beat? Sure. I think that if I, if I can just share some tips and ideas for families, if they're watching or providers of young children, definitely Google is your friend. If you're looking for resources for yoga for kids, find what works for you and what feels right. It doesn't need to be lengthy and it doesn't need to be this grand thing. It can be something that you feel comfortable with and implementing. Access your local supports like the YMCA, United Way, Head Start programs. Don't be afraid to reach out and ask them where they can get support or who do I go to for, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for. People are always willing to help, especially in education. And then, you know, reach out to the parent groups and, you know, just access your supports. Amazing. Thank you so much for that. All right, so now we get to close the interview, Nicole, with a little game we call Three in a Beat. 
which is a game where I ask you three questions. And the challenge is you have to answer these questions in either one word or maximum one sentence. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready to play? I'm ready. All right. So first question, what is something worth fighting for? Integrity. Amazing. Second question. What's the lesson that took you the longest to learn? Mm. Mm. Stick by your beliefs when you know you're right. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's powerful. I like it. All right. And then last question. This should be easy. What is your favorite quote? Teachers open the door, but you must enter yourself. Oh, wow. I never heard that before. Really nice. All right. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nicole. This has been such a joy to, to speak with you and learn from you. Definitely, please keep us updated at the channel on all this work that you're doing. And particularly, I hope you get this program off the ground and, and are able to track some results. We'll be happy to have you back on the channel so you can share with us any statistics, anything that would serve the childcare industry as a whole. And you watching us, if you like this interview, if you like this episode, please do share it. Subscribe to the channel because we're going to have more people like Nicole who have something of value to share that could perhaps really support you on having a bigger impact in the children and the space in childcare that you serve. Nicole, any last words before we part? No, thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you so much. And everybody, we'll see you on the next episode.